Hello and welcome. In the next few lectures, we are going to be looking at advanced controller structures. We have looked at the simple feedback control structure or controller structure. Uh, now we are going to cover enhancements to the simple feedback controller structure. Uh, the first of those enhancements is feed forward and ratio control. Ratio control is in particular often encountered in the process industry because we want to maintain streams in ratio. And then of course there is this idea behind feedback or rather feed forward where the basic idea is to adjust the manipulated variable to counter the expected effect of a disturbance that is measured. Uh, the key word is measured. So if you for example know that it is going to get cold tonight then you can start the heater maybe in the evening so that when things get cold your room is already warm and you don't face any discomfort. So this is anticipating a disturbance, anticipating the effect of the disturbance and taking measures to counter it. We do it often in life. Now let's look at a simple process with a disturbance at the process output. So you have the control input U, you have the disturbance T, the controller, uh, the control input transfer function GP and the disturbance transfer function GD. So this is my process. Now this signal U adjustment to the valve position comes from either an operator or a controller, a feedback controller, a standard feedback controller. And now I want a correction. I want a correction to this valve position. And what is this correction going to be? What I want is this correction should be such that the effect of the disturbance on Y which is GDD. I want a correction made, I, I want to make an adjustment to U so that the signal here is minus GDD and so when the disturbance occurs the plus GDD here and the minus GDD here add up to cancel Y remains at 0. So even though the disturbance has occurred, I make a correction, an anticipatory correction or a feed forward correction. I make a feed forward correction such that the effect of the disturbance gets countered by appropriate changes in the valve position U. So this is the idea behind feed forward control. So now the question is how should I make this feed forward correction and a bit of reflection, moments reflection will tell you what should I put in here. Well a moments reflection will tell you if you put GFF is equal to minus GD by GP then you can see that this signal would be minus GD by GP times D and therefore this signal would be minus GD times D and this signal will be GD times D and when you add these up Y remains at 0. But of course in reality we never know GP and GD perfectly. We have an approximation to GP and GD. We have a model for GP and GD but we never know GP and GD exactly and therefore the feed forward compensator is based on you know these tildes model of the disturbance effect on the output model of the control input effect on the output take the ratio of the two negative sign and you got your feed forward compensator. Of course, 
if you take GP and GD to be first order and dead time, so for example, if you have uh, GP model is a gain times e to the power minus theta p s divided by tau p s plus 1 and g d is equal to again times e to the power minus theta d s divided by tau d s plus 1 then your feed forward compensator turns out to be minus kd by kp tau p s plus 1 divided by tau d s plus 1 into e to the power minus theta d minus theta p s so you can see that your feed forward compensator is again a lag sorry a lead lag and a dead time care must be exercised in putting in the dead time because if theta p is greater than theta d that means the control input has a larger dead time the output with respect to the control input u has a larger dead, dead time compared to with respect to the disturbance d in that case this number is negative if theta p is greater than theta d in which case the term would be e to the power plus some number times s where d, d is equal to minus theta d minus theta, theta p and this is physically not realizable because what it means is I do something now its effect you see e to the power minus ds where d is a positive number is I do something now its effect shows up d time units from now so e to the power plus ds would be I do something now its effect shows up in the past nobody can travel back in time you know so this is not realizable and so you for if theta p is greater than theta d then e to the power minus the 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 the, 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 the dead time term is not physically realizable and it has to be omitted so that's what I mean to say that e to the power plus theta s is unrealizable and care must be exercised now let's take a very simple example we have GP is equal to 2 over 2 over s plus 1 whole cube and GD is 4 s plus 1 whole square plus 2s plus 1 so the disturbance transfer function you can see the time constants are 4 and 2 here the time constant is 1 so disturbance has a much slower effect than 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 the process and now what we want is that fit first order plus dead time models to GP and GD because GP and GD are not known exactly ever so what you can do is you can get the process reaction curve the process reaction curve will be s shaped to that s shaped curve you can fit a first order plus dead time model and based on those models obtain your feed forward compensator and uh, in this example what what I'm saying is that uh, you should use analytical methods only you're not allowed to do a simulink simulation and 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 obtain your model so use analytical methods alone in order to do the fitting and then obtain the feed forward compensator so <coughs> now if we look at fitting a model we have to get the process reaction curve so let's fit a model to GP 
so if you give a unit step to the control input and record the output response the output response would be y of u in the Laplace domain to a unit step would be 2 times 1 over s that's the unit step times s plus 1 whole cube this is what the unit step response to a step change unit step change in the control input u would be similarly the unit step response to a unit step change in in the disturbance would be uh, y of d would be equal to 1 over s times 2s plus 1 times 4s plus 1 whole square <coughs> so this guy is going to be 2 times we'll just call 2 times f 2 times a by s plus b by s plus 1 plus c by s plus 1 whole square plus d by this is d not s d by d by s plus 1 whole cube we are using partial fractions here and a is going to be equal to s times f calculated at s equal to 0 this gives us how much does this give us this gives us a is equal to Uh, D would be S plus 1 whole cube times F calculated at S equal to minus 1 and this gives us D is equal to well minus 1 uh, C would be equal to D by DS S plus 1 whole cube times oh well F derivative of this guy calculated at s equal to minus 1 uh, this implies so s plus 1 whole cube would be 1 over s 1 over s differentiated would be minus 1 over s square mm, so this implies that c is also equal to minus 1 now let's look at b you will have to differentiate it twice and maybe you'll also get a factor of 2 there because you're differentiating it twice so we will have to think this through so let me think this through uh, let's think this through okay so if I want to calculate B what I will do is I'll multiply by s plus 1 whole cube both sides uh, and then what I'll get is s plus 1 whole cube f is equal to a by s times s plus 1 whole cube plus b times s plus 1 whole square plus c times s plus 1 
plus t if i differentiate it once i will get s plus 1 derivative of this guy is going to be a times s plus 1 whole cube minus divided by s square plus 3 times s plus 1 whole square divided by s plus <coughs> 2 times b times s plus 1 plus c plus 0 so differentiating again second derivative will be okay when you differentiate it again no matter what you do s plus 1 would be common there will be a common factor of s plus 1 so it will be a times s plus 1 which is common times something which we are not interested in plus 2b that's what the second derivative is and now if I put s equal to minus 1 on both sides then that implies b is equal to actually half of the second derivative of calculated at s equal to minus 1. So that's what we have to do to calculate b. So b is equal to half of second derivative of s plus 1 whole cube f divided by calculated at s equal to minus 1 so we are left with 1 by s you differentiate it once it becomes minus 1 by s square differentiate it twice it becomes minus 1 huh, is that right 2 by s cube half of that calculated at s equal to minus 1 which is equal to minus 1 so a equal to 1 b equal to minus 1 c equal to minus 1 d is equal to minus 1 therefore the partial fraction expansion of y of u is actually equal to 2 times 1 by s minus 1 by s plus 1 minus 1 by s plus 1 square minus 1 over s plus 1 whole cube and so y of u turns out to be 2 times 1 minus e to the power minus t minus t times e to the power minus t minus half of because if you look at the inverse Laplace transform of this guy that's actually this t square times e to the power minus t inverse and, and, and we are using the result here inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s plus 1 to the power n is actually equal to 
1 over n minus 1 factorial times t to the power n minus 1 e to the power minus t. That's what we're using. So now we have got yu and uh, I want to fit a first order plus dead time model to it. So 28.3 percent of the response uh, would be because the total response is 2 to a unit step change. So 28.3 times 2. How much is that? 0 0.28. Actually it's 0 0.2835. Eh? 10, 3 to the 6, 7, 2 to the 16, 2 to the 4, 0.562. So, how long does it take for the response to reach 0.562? So, that will give me T28.3. And what I will do is, I will assume a value of T, calculate y and if it is not 0.5620 I will reassume a value of t and keep changing t until y becomes equal to 0 0.5620 and you can use f0 in MATLAB to get the response but I have I've done it here it turns out that 28.3 response time uh, is a 1.8 uh, is appro approximately 1.8 Eight five minutes. Similarly, T sixty three point two percent. That means sixty three point two twice would be four six. How long does it take? What is the time it takes for Y to reach one point two six four? That time is T sixty three point two. Again, iteratively this can be obtained, and I have done the necessary calculations, and it turns out to be approximately 3.26 minutes and then we have our usual expression of uh, tau is equal to 3 by 2 times t28 uh, sorry t63.2 T 63.2 minus T 28.3 so that gives us a time constant tau of model time constant tau uh, of 2.11 minutes similarly the dead time model dead time turns out to be half of 3 times t28.3 minus t63.2 you do that and it turns out that theta this implies that theta turns out to be 1.15 minutes And so, my model turns out to be GP model turns out to be the gain is 2 e to the power minus 1.5. 15s divided by 2.11s plus 1. That's the model that I get from all this calculation. This is the model that we get. Alright, so let's keep this in mind. Now we need to fit a model for GD. We need to develop a model for GD. And uh, For GD, what we will get is the step response YD is going to be 1 over S times 4S plus 1 whole square times 
to s plus 1 which is equal to 4 square times 2 that's 32 take 32 common so 1 by 32 times 1 by s times s plus 1 by 4 whole square times s plus half that is equal to 1 by 32 times f and f must be equal to by partial fractions a by s plus p over s plus half plus c over s plus 1 by 4 plus d over s plus 1 by 4 whole square and you have a is equal to s times f calculated at s is equal to 0 this implies a is equal to 1 over 1 by 4 whole square times 1 by 2 so that's actually 32 okay b is equal to s plus half times f calculated at s is equal to minus half this implies that actually b is equal to 1 over minus half times minus half plus 1 by 4 whole square and this guy will turn out to be uh, minus minus half plus 1 by 4 is minus 1 by 4 minus 1 by 4 square is 1 by 16 32 so this will actually be minus 32 so what we get is uh, maybe I should just revise this a bit so what you get is that B is equal to minus 32 now let's look at D because D can be calculated easily so D turns out to be s plus 1 by 4 whole square times f calculated at s is equal to minus 1 by 4 <coughs> this implies that d is going to be 1 over minus 1 by 4 times minus 1 by 4 plus half this implies that d is equal to actually uh, minus 16 eh? yeah and uh, let's look at c c is going to be d by ds of s plus 1 by 4 whole square of f differentiate this and calculate the value of the resulting expression at s is equal to minus 1 by 4 this implies that uh, c must be equal to differentiating d by ds of 1 by s times 1 by s plus half calculated at s is equal to minus 1 by 4 so derivative of this guy is going to be 1 over s plus half into 1 over 
s square minus 1 by s into 1 over s plus half whole square uh, s plus half into s common le sakte hain. so we will take 1 by s into s plus half s common and then maybe minus common le lo hai. so minus and then we will get uh, 1 by s plus 1 over s plus half is that right oh is that right oh th yaar. and calculate this whole thing at so at s equal to minus 1 by 4 and you can see that at s equal to minus 1 by 4 this term is minus 4 and this term is plus 4 and minus 4 plus 4 is equal to 0 so this whole thing actually goes to 0 which implies that c is actually equal to 0 so after all these calculations what we get is y of d is equal to 1 by 32 times 32 by s minus 32 by s plus half minus 16 by s plus 1 by 4 whole square so that turns out to be 1 by s minus 1 by s plus half minus 1 by 2 by s plus 1 by 4 whole square and so this gives me in the time domain yd is equal to 1 minus e to the power minus t by 2 minus uh, t by 2 times e to the power minus t by 4 and I can calculate t 28.3 iteratively guess a value of t substitute into this equation and see if the right hand side is 0.283 or not if not keep guessing t again and again until the calculated y becomes 0.283 and I've done that calculation and we get t 28.3 as 6.03 minutes similarly we get t 63.2 as 10.79 minutes and thus we obtain tau as 3 by 2 times t 63.2 minus t 28.3 and this gives us a tau of 7.14 minutes and dead time theta turns out to be half times 3 times t 28.3 minus T sixty three point two, which implies the dead time is actually three point six five minutes. And so <coughs> the transfer function model for GD 
actually turns out to be e to the power minus 3.65 s divided by 7.14 s plus 1 all this effort to get this model and I can now then get G feed forward as minus G D tilde by G P tilde and if I look at the previous slide I already have G P tilde and so what we get is GFF is equal to minus 1 by 2 that's the gain part times 2.11 s plus 1 divided by 7.14 s plus 1 that's the lead lag part and then the dead time part would be uh, e to the power minus 3.65 minus 1.15 so that's 2.5 okay so that's my feed forward compensator that has been derived after obtaining a model for GD and GP okay my feed forward compensator so this is my feed forward compensator okay so to summarize this is what we hi So to summarize, shucks, I cleared everything up. Oh, I am so sorry. Can we do control Z? Oh, well, I'm sorry. I think I've, I've cleared everything up. Yeah, the entire derivation has been erased. Well, anyway, so I guess sorry about that, but so we used partial fractions to express yu which was this in terms of partial fractions and then we inverted to the time domain to get the analytical expression for the output response to a change in u and then we obtained t28.3 and t63.2 iteratively and from the time values we were able to obtain GP model as shown there did the same thing for the disturbance response to unit step in the disturbance and so we expressed YD which was this as in terms of partial fractions and then inverting to the time domain gave us an analytical expression for the output response to a change in disturbance D and iteratively we then obtained T28.3 and T63.2 and from there we got a model for the disturbance and finally obtained the, G for the feed forward compensator as noted here now there could be multiple disturbances or there could be a set point change so feed forward if there's a disturbance it helps maintain the output at set point or it helps 
maintain deviations away from set point or eliminate deviations away from set point should there be a major disturbance but then there could be unmeasured disturbances and there could also be a need to change the set point and drive the process to a different set point in which case we need feed feedback control to reject the unmeasured disturbances and also to track a changing set point in order to do that one can combine feed forward and feedback and it's actually pretty straightforward this is the feed forward compensation and this is the feedback compensation GC is the feedback controller GFF is the feed forward controller and that's it and if you if you derive the transfer function y with respect to y set point you'll find that y by y set point would be what forward path between the input and the output so that's GCGP divided by 1 plus whatever is in the negative feedback path so that's GCGP again and if you want the transfer function of y with respect to d the disturbance what do we have forward path so that's from the input to the output so there is one forward path which is this and there's another forward path which is this and both are added so we will say gd times d so forward path is gd and the other one is gff and gff is actually equal to minus gd model by g sorry g uh, by gp model and so this path would be minus gd model divided by gp model times gp divided by whatever is in the feed one plus whatever is in the feedback path so which is gcgp and you can see if the model is not if there is large plant model mismatch then this term is approximately equal to zero but not exactly zero and then you could have feedback control actually amplifying depending on what is the controller tuning that you use actually amplifying the dynamic remnants due to plant model mismatch yeah so what I'm trying to say here is that if your model was perfect this would this term would be zero exactly in which case disturbance comes disturbance goes up as a step y remains at zero so this is d this is y perfect but if the if the correction is if the plant model are not exactly matched then you will have some dynamic remnant with feed forward control now if you combine it with feedback this dynamic remnant can actually get amplified that is what I mean if the numerator is not exactly zero and this amplification will get worse and worse and worse as the plant model mismatch becomes worse and worse and worse okay so <coughs> that's the point that becomes obvious by analyzing the transfer functions okay how do you tune the feedback controller you can see the characteristic equation remains the same as for a standard feedback controller with no feed forward compensation and therefore you can tune the feedback loop using standard methods and as an example I've tried to do this for the same process and uh, what we want to do is tune a PID controller with tau i and tau d chosen to cancel appropriate open loop poles 
and Kc chosen for a closed loop damping coefficient of 0.5 which is not too oscillatory. So you can see that GP, so GC, if I look at GC, uh, there's, there's three poles all at S equal to minus 1. So tau y I'll set equal to 1 to cancel one of the poles, tau d also I'll set equal to 1 to cancel the other pole and then what I have is GC is equal to Kc times S plus 1 divided by S times S plus 1 divided by 0 0.1 S plus 1 and GCGP then will turn out, no, turn, turn out to be 2 times Kc divided by S into into why is this not going? This S is not going. I don't know what's wrong with it. Okay doesn't matter so GC GP is equal to 2 times KC divided by S times S plus 1 into 0 0.1 S plus 1 this is what I have and uh, this will give us a closed loop characteristic equation as 1 plus GCGP is equal to 0 which implies S times S plus 1 into 0 0.1 S plus 1 plus 2 KC is equal to 0 which implies 0 0.1 S cube plus uh, 1.1 huh? 1.1 S square uh, plus S plus 2 KC is equal to 0 and for a, for a closed loop damping coefficient of 0.5 implies the angle of the roots imaginary part to so if, if I have a root here this angle phi is going to be cos inverse of which is equal to 60, de 60 degrees yeah cos inverse half is 60 degrees uh, which implies that s equal to minus a plus square root 3 aj satisfies the closed loop characteristic equation satisfies closed loop characteristic equation substituting this into the closed loop characteristic equation here what we then get is 0 0.1 times uh, maybe I should use some more space what we then get is 0 0.1 times 8 a cube plus 1.1 1 .1 times minus 2 minus 2 square root 3 j times a square minus plus minus a plus square root 3 aj plus 2 kc is equal to 0 combining the so that gives us 0 0.8 a cube minus 2.2 a square minus a plus 2 Kc, that's the real part, plus uh, square root 3 
AJ is what I'll take common, so that will be 1 minus 2.2A is equal to 0. So this implies this guy should be 0 and of course that guy should also be 0. So this guy equal to 0 implies A is equal to 1 by 2.2 that is equal to 0 0.454545 I just re keeps repeating and from this equation we get Kc is equal to 1 half times a plus 2.2 a square minus 0 0.8 a cube and once you do that that implies that Kc is equal to, if you do the substitution, you get Kc is equal to 0 0.417. So, if we design our controller using standard root locus kind of techniques or complex analysis kind of techniques in the Laplace domain, uh, the tuning that we are getting is Kc is equal to 0 0.417 tau i is equal to 1 minute and tau d is equal to 1 minute. So that's the tuning that we got and then what I did was simulate the thing and get some dynamic responses and plot them. So this is how we got the tuning. We chose tau i and tau d to be 1 minute each to cancel the open loop pole that is equal to minus 1. So that gave us uh, GCGP as here and a closed loop characteristic equation as here and then we said that for closed loop damping coefficient of 0.3 or 0.5 s equal to minus a plus square root 3 aj must satisfy the closed loop characteristic equation and you substitute it into the characteristic equation and you then get the real part and the imaginary part the imaginary part equal to 0 gives a is equal to minus uh, a is equal to 0.4545 and so s equal to this guy where this number is square root 3 times 0.4545 this is the closed loop characteristic equation root and root locus says the magnitude condition in root locus says that hmm, okay there's a mistake here this is actually 2kc is equal to this yeah 2kc is equal to this and from there we get so this is actually half there's a factor of half that's missing so you get kc is equal to 0.417 so that's that and I simulated to get some dynamic results first let's look at the model fit so the process reaction curve of u to a unit step change in u is the blue curve here and the model fit is the magenta curve here and you can see the model is you know fitting the blue curve reasonably well same thing for the disturbance response over here and then when you look at the feedback control results and the feed forward control results this is feed forward only control this is PID feedback the way we have designed PID only and the tuning is stated here This is feed forward plus feedback and you can see uh, this bump has gotten amplified. What was a smaller bump has gotten actually amplified. Uh, the, the black dashed curve is actually perfect. feed forward 
and what I mean by perfect feed forward is that remember GP is equal to 2 by S plus 1 whole cube GD is equal to 1 over 4s plus 1 whole square times 2s plus 1. Of course, we never know this in practice, but if we knew it, then we have a we know the process perfectly, and then our compensator can be perfect, and then, then our compensator would be minus GD by GP. So that guy would be. minus half times s plus 1 whole cube divided by 4s plus 1 whole square times 2s plus 1. This is a physically realizable compensator. It's three lead lags in series s plus 1 by 4s plus 1 times s plus 1 by 4s plus 1 times s plus 1 divided by 2s plus 1. So it's three lead lags in series and if we had implemented this compensator the black curve is what we would have gotten. So you can see if you have a perfect model y stays bang on at 0. No disturb, no, no deviation even if no, no deviation in the output for the disturbance. Even if we have a reasonably good model, which is what we have here and here, you can see that the feed forward compensated response, if you calculate the integral absolute error, for example, it's not far, far better than what we got for a PID controller that we tune using the simple root locus technique. So the point is that for feed forward to work, the model must be really good otherwise it is better to just do feedback feed forward is recommended only if you have a model that fits the plant quite well so need highly accurate models for feed forward to be better than simple feedback in fact we've got a reasonably good model here and feedback is about as good as feed forward yeah if the model had gotten any worse, feed forward would have been worse. Yeah, So that is a major point that we must keep in mind. It all sounds very good, oh we'll have a model and then but if, the mo if, if your plant changes, which it does because operating conditions change, equipment degrade, if your model and plant are not well matched, performance degradation will be severe in feed forward control. that is the general problem with model based control techniques because if the model is not good the control performance just goes for a toss okay so this is a very simple example of that now we look at ratio control in ratio control we maintain a process stream in ratio with another wild stream so let us say here's a wild stream and you want a manipulated stream to vary in ratio with the while stream that means if the while stream goes up 10% the manipulated stream should also go up 10% and let us say we want it to be immediate we want it to be immediate for example if you're feeding two reactants into a reactor so a plus b goes to c let us say a plus b goes to c so you got fresh a and fresh b and let's say fresh a is wild fresh b is what you are manipulating you want fresh b to follow A. So then in this situation because this is going mixing and then going to the reactor you want A and B to be in ratio all the time exactly. So if A goes up 10% I want B to go up 10% immediately. So these kind of controls is done using a ratio controller and the simplest implementation or the or the or the or the most robust recommendation of ratio control is as, as follows. You've got a flow controller on the manipulated stream. The flow controller has a set point. This is that set point. This set point comes from the while stream. 
So you have the while stream flow. The while stream flow is multiplied by the ratio set point. So let us say this is F1 and this is F2. Then the, so the ratio set point is F1 by F2. This is the desired ratio set point. You multiply this number with the measured value of F2 and so you get the desired value of F1 set point. And this flow controller will be a first one. So it will immediately give a very quickly track. Very quickly make changes to the well position so that F1 becomes equal to F1 set point. So this is maintaining a process stream in ratio with another while stream. Sometimes what happens is you want, you know, the while stream goes up. So while stream has gone up, but then you want your, the stream that is supposed to follow. So F2 goes up like a step, but then F1 should, you know, go to F2 or change by the same percentage, but it should go up slowly. This is common in, for example, when you use uh, reflux to feed ratios in a distillation column. So in a distillation column, you've got the feed coming in, you've got the reflux coming in, and if feed goes up, you know that if feed goes up 10%, reflux should also go up 10%, but then the feed effect in order to reach up takes time. So this increase in reflux should only happen as more heavy key starts reaching up there as, as this product or as the composition towards the top of the column starts going down. That will happen in some time and so what you want is if the feed goes up as a step you want reflux to go up slowly. So for these kinds of situations what you do is put in a lag on the output of the multiplier and then the set point of the manipulated stream will have the lag. So while stream goes up like this, but the manipulated stream goes up like this. Yeah, this is commonly done in, for example, distillation columns. Reflux to feed ratio. With this, we come to a close of this lecture. It's a good time to summarize whatever we have seen. Feed forward control, the idea is to adjust the manipulated variable in a manner that counteracts the expected effect of a measured disturbance. This expected business means that you have a model of the effect of the control input on the output and a model for the effect of the disturbance, the measured disturbance on the output. And we saw that the feed forward compensator was minus GD by GP. And like I said earlier, it requires for feed forward control, you need a model of disturbance and manipulated variable effect on the output. You need GD hat and GP hat. We also saw that feed forward is effect effective only with high fidelity models where GD hat and GP hat are a good representation, uh, are a good fit to the actual process response. Otherwise, simple feedback would outperform feed forward. So with feed forward control, one has to be cautious to make sure that the model is always in sync with the plant. A ratio control is a feed forward idea where you maintain a process stream in ratio with a while stream. And this is used for moving flows in tandem. You could lag the flow set point to the manipulated stream and then the manipulated stream will follow the while stream but with a lag or you could have no lag depending on the situation it all depends what are your operating objectives with this we come to a close of this lecture thank you very much for your kind attention thank you and goodbye thanks again